Okay, we are now live. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us um, for our discussion this evening, Big Organising for Climate. My name's Gully and um, I'll be your host this evening. Um, I'm really, really pleased to be joined by three people with a, a wealth of really varied experience in how progressive movements can communicate with and inspire people and most importantly galvanize them into taking action. So I'll start by warmly welcoming Ellen from Green New Deal Rising and Nula from XSTAR's uh, Project 3.5 team and Joe from the Social Practice and formerly uh, Momentum. So anyone, just a reminder, this is a Q&A, so there's loads of wisdom here to be, to be plumbed. So um, everyone's encouraged to put your questions in the chat wherever you're watching. If you're in, with us on Zoom, you can put your questions in the Zoom chat. If you're on any of the other platforms, you can put it in the comments. Um, we'll try and get to as many of your questions as we can. Um, so I'm not gonna say much more. I'm just gonna hand over to you all to hear more about what you've been working on and, and what you've learned about mobilization. But all I'll quickly say in context is what we all here already know, I'm sure, that there has never been a greater need to mobilize a radical, diverse, unified mass movement for change in this country. The breakdown of our climate is paired with a dangerous political environment, including a crackdown on our right to protest, and the massive profits of climate criminals is matched by ordinary people forced to choose between putting food on the table or paying their energy bills. It was recently reported that global banks are preparing for an unprecedented surge in civil unrest in Europe, the US and the UK due to the cost of living crisis. Any way that we can find of actually talking to each other for a first about what's actually happening before our very eyes and then of organizing together in our communities and across movements will help us build the people power we need to change things. So Nula, first I'm gonna to pass to you to tell us a bit about what Project 3.5 has been doing in XR. Then we'll hear from Ellen and then Joe, and then we'll, we'll open out for questions. Go ahead, Nula. Thanks so much, Gully. And it's super exciting to be here with all of you. Um, uh, yeah, coming to you from very, very hot London. Um, so my name's Nula. Um, I've been involved in XR since late 2018 and mostly on the media team and thinking about how we communicate with and reach people. And then more recently with Project 3.5 and again, thinking about how we communicate and reach people, but, but how we do that on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, so I come at it from both of those perspectives of, of, of like reaching people through the media and, and through conversations. Um, and I just wanted to start by giving like a bit of context for how Project 3.5 emerged in Extinction Rebellion. So, so when XR launched in late 2018, it was designed to facilitate what we call mass participation MBDA. So like thousands of people getting to show up and step up and, and like, ref, you know, refuse to comply with what's happening by, by making small acts of, of civil disobedience, like low level law breaking. And that happened in April 2019. We had thousands of people on the streets day after day, and we saw, you know, not enough, but we saw the government really shift in response to that. We got a declaration by Parliament that we were in a climate emergency, which back then was a big deal. Um, now it's become like common um, and a net zero date. Um, and actually, someone called Frank Hewitson from Greenpeace said something really nice about Extinction Rebellion. He said that we democratized direct action and that that was something new in the activist space. Um, and one of our principles and values that we were founded on was that we set our mission at what is necessary and how we how we went about designing our theory of change was informed by Erica Chenoweth's research that when 3.5% of a population is actively engaged and for a sustained period, that gives you a good chance of getting your demands met. Um, so I know for me, like, when I saw XR spring onto the scene in 2018, the fact that the, the response was set by, by how urgent and how big a scale well, the mission was, was a big deal, that it was proportionate. I was like willing to put everything behind something 
that was actually going, I'm going to tackle this. I'm not just going to look at a tiny bit of the crisis that like what's happening to trees or what's happening to birds, but like we're going to look at the whole thing and we're going to work our strategy back from what's needed. Um, and then as time went on, we became real experts in direct action. And then the pandemic hit. So direct action was pretty much all we could do. We couldn't gather in mass numbers, but we could go out there and do stunts. And that meant that it became what we did in some way. And there's also a way that kind of counterintuitively um, breaking the law in central London is a bit easier than having a conversation than with someone who might disagree with you. <laughs> So, at, you know, we talk about pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones. I think Project 3.5 is very much about that. Um, so I think at the end of 2021, a lot of us came to the same conclusion that if we wanted to be able to be really honest with ourselves, that we were actually doing something that we thought was the best bet of like getting everyone to face and do something about the climate crisis, we had to shift our movement from being experts only in direct action to also being experts in mobilization and outreach and to being excited about that as a project. So project 3.5 was born um, and we, in order to design that, we looked at the lessons from the US, from the Bernie Sanders campaign, things that were coming out of momentum and what people had learned about big organizing, about building volunteer driven um, organizing models. Um, and we came up with a set of like listening based canvassing tools that work in a distributed model. So that means they can function at any scale. It means like three people can go and do it or 3000 people can go and do it. There's no ceiling on the number of people who can take this and run with it. Um, and it's called 3.5, obviously, after Erica Chenoweth's research. Um, and that's about being too big to ignore and too big to repress. We don't know if 3.5% is gonna turn out to be the magic number. It might be lower, it might be higher, but we know we need those two things to be so big they can't ignore us and so big they can't repress us. They have to listen to us. Um, and this is really a big experiment because our end goal when we like knock on someone's door and have a conversation is that that person will take part in civil disobedience. And so we're not trying to get them to vote and we're not trying to get them to change their mind on an issue, which is what these models have, have, as far as I understand, mostly been used for. So because we're trying to do something that hasn't been done before, it means we have to like look at how it's working and we have to change in response to what works well and what doesn't seem to work. Um, but uh, Becky Bond, who worked on the Sanders campaign and is an authority on these things, said that the good news for organizers who want to help build the political revolution is that people are really just waiting for you to ask them to do something big. And that is really good news for us. Um, so finally, I just want to say a little bit about like what we've learned so far and what the progress so far has been in Project 3.5. So I'm going to share a few of the stats that we've got um, off the back of door knocking. So we found like We've, we've got, uh, I think, around 60 to 70 XR local groups around the UK actively doing Project 3.5, another 30 or so who've, who've shown interest and are getting started. And the average from their efforts is one hour out door knocking gets you 0.22 people to a talk. But the thing to say about that is that the range around the country is really big. So it ranges from 0.05 people per hour to 2.38 people. And to put that in terms that are like a bit more easy to understand and mean something, it means basically if you do the minimum amount of door knocking we ask groups to do when they put on a talk, 15 hours, then you might get one person if you're lucky to the talk through that door knocking, or you might get 36 people. And that's a really important lesson for us. It means door knocking has to be one of a like suite of approaches for getting people in the room. But that said, you could say, OK, well, why do we bother doing the door knocking? It's like a hard slog. Um, but everything that we've learned from the people who've done this is that 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 bit is really essential because it's doing several different jobs at once. So for one thing, it's turning us into a movement of researchers. So like over 7000 conversations have happened on doorsteps between XR local group people and their neighbors. So 
the media tells us who the public are, what they think, what they think about us. But actually, we're going out and meeting them, finding out who they are and finding out who they actually feel. So, yeah, thanks, Daily Mail. We actually don't need your assessment of who the public are anymore. We know each other. Um, and we're also putting, you know, these people have also all seen the stereotypes of, of Extinction Rebellion. So often when people knock on someone's door, they'll get some things that have almost, you know, could be quoting the Sun or the Mail. And that person has, a, you know, someone who lives on the same street or the next street to them, standing in front of them, interested in what they think, willing to listen, and this stereotype they've been given in the media, and they have to reconcile those two things. So that's really powerful as well. It's also something local groups do together and in person, and it pushes us out of our comfort zones. And we know that from our rebellions, from our mass actions, that when you get to be together, and do stuff that scares you, that's like really important for building and strengthening our movement. Um, we also know from other people who do canvassing that like, if you get a flyer or you see an online ad, you're not likely to like chat to your friends or family about the fact that, that happened. But if someone knocks on your door and like asks you questions and says, will you come to a talk and says, we really want to tackle this, that's something that's worth having a conversation about. So other conversations happen as a result of these conversations. Um, and just to finish up, one of the, you know, what we find on the doorstep is people know we're in a climate crisis. They know it's serious. They know the government doesn't have a credible plan. The thing they're not sure about is that they can do anything to change it. So that is really like laser focus for us now. That is the challenge, like that to, com to give people a sense of their own power and that there's a plan that's worth trying. Um, and so in conclusion, I guess what we've learned since we launched in January is that we are not a door knocking initiative, that we're not a phone banking campaign. We're not an online ad campaign. We're a project focused on activating 100,000 people to come out onto the streets of London by a combination of the most effective methods. And that 100,000 is what we've kind of thought, think is a reasonable trigger number to get 3.5% of the population out because we know they come out, they flood onto the streets when it looks like a moment's happening. So that's my summary of project 3.5 and where things are at. Um, and I am super excited that we get to hear from some people outside XR. So I'm gonna pass to Ellen from Green New Deal Rising. Thanks, Nula. Um, Hi everyone, it's really nice to be here. So many of you on the call, which is really, really great. Um, my name's Ellen. I am the digital organizer at Green New Deal Rising. Um, I've been there for a couple of years now, having had my climate brain sort of reawoken in about 2018 by the school strikes um, and XR. I'd always been a bit worried about climate change, or very worried about climate change as a child and as a teenager but it had been too big to engage with and too scary and actually all it took back in 2018 was uh to see that like look thousands of other people are scared too and they're taking action and look these people have a plan um to solve these many crises that we face and i say that because it feels relevant to tonight's discussion that you know, to recognize that that's probably true for a lot of people as well. They're not apathetic or hostile. Actually, the majority of people are probably just scared and overwhelmed and they want to feel like they're part of something bigger and like there is a solution to all of this. And that's all we have to offer them um, to build these movements that we need. So I'm going to talk about who Green New Deal Rising are, why we exist, um, a little bit about what we've achieved since we launched last August, and then our approach to mobilizing and organizing, which hopefully will be interesting to some of you. Um, so Green New Deal Rising is a movement of young people from all walks of life. Um, we are united by having grown up in what feels like an age of crisis. So from the financial crash to the climate crisis and then most recently the pandemic, just feels like one thing after another for young people. Um, and we're scared, but we're also ready to fight for a better future, which we saw with the Fridays for Future movement, the climate strikes. There's loads of appetite among young people to get out there and fight for a future for themselves and for people across the world. When we launched Green New Deal Rising, we wanted to build a really strong youth movement who could have real political impact, 
with a strong DNA and a strong inclusive culture that could be embedded and replicated across the movement. That was really important to us to make sure that everyone who joined our movement understood the culture and understood the values um, and the principles that we wanted to embed. And we wanted to make the Green New Deal the hot topic of the next election, at a time when Labour seemed to be nowhere on climate and the Tories were kind of halfway successful at greenwashing their own record. So the plan, when we launched and still is, to disrupt the political narrative by forcing politicians to pick a side. Green New Deal or no? Are you with us or are you against us? There's no sitting on the fence, there's no halfway house. That's the challenge that we set to politicians and that's the question we asked them. The second part of the strategy was to talk to everyone in our communities to build public support for the Green New Deal. And that's something we've just started doing this year. Uh, and then eventually the plan is to elect inspiring Green New Deal champions who can fight for us in Parliament as well. And all of these things together and the work that we put in to make them happen will make the Green New Deal an era defining issue. So since we've launched, how have we done so far? We've managed to recruit over a thousand young people onto our Slack, which is where we organize. Um, 580 of those organizers have attended an MP challenge, which is where we send a group of people out with a smartphone to challenge an MP at a public event over their support for the Green New Deal or uh, possibly expose their backing of uh, harmful climate destroying policies. Some of these challenges have had political impact. One of the first ones we did was a challenge uh, of Nicola Sturgeon and she, as a result of that and other actions by Stop Cambo and other groups, changed her tune on the Cambo oil field quite quickly afterwards. Uh, we forced Rishi Sunak on record by filming a challenge with him at a cricket club in his constituency last year. Uh, and some of these challenges have had cultural impact and they've gone viral. We had um, a challenge of Pretty Patel quite recently, which has got, I think, five million views across social media, where we stood infiltrated a fundraising dinner and stood up on chairs one by one just as she started to speak to express our disappointment and disgust over the Rwanda policy and the UK's hostile environment in general. Um, we've also trained up 30 volunteer leaders um, from diverse backgrounds because we wanted to make sure that our movement uh, wasn't just open to everyone but actively encouraged people who were not represented in the climate movement to participate and we've got 40 more on the program for this year. We took over 200 organisers to Glasgow for COP26 and 120 came up to Coventry last month for our first mass door knocking event. I'm going to go into a bit more detail about that now because that feels particularly relevant. Um, so of those 120 volunteers, we knocked on 1400 doors in Coventry, um, had 320 conversations and of those 320, 255 of them signed up to the movement, which feels like a ridiculous number. And it just shows that like tackling the cost of living crisis and the climate crisis together is a huge priority for people. You can turn up on someone's doorstep and say, I'm here as a young person, I'm worried about my future. We're worried about, you know, getting to the end of the month. Will you join our movement? We're fighting for change. And most people, a majority of people will sign up. We learned a lot as well that weekend. Um, one positive is when you're canvassing outside of a sort of election and party context, it's actually quite simple to set up a canvassing operation. Um, and we're thinking now about how to create the tools that you need to run canvassing sessions locally. And I'm sure Project 3.5 have loads of useful knowledge on that that I might pick your brains about. Um, and we also learned that the people who did sign up to the movement are not necessarily super engaged with the organizing or getting involved in the work of the movement just yet. So people need a bit more encouragement, a bit more kind of leading up that ladder of engagement um, to really get involved in building the movement, which makes sense. It's a big jump from just being, opening your door to a complete stranger to like, you know, getting straight stuck into organizing work. So um, that's a useful thing to know. The next thing we were planning was sending 500 young people to Yorkshire to turn up the heat on Rishi Sunak in his constituency. But then he resigned from the government and uh, that plan's a bit up in the air now. So we're rethinking that one. Um, 
so our sort of approach to organizing and mobilizing my understanding is that these are different things organizing is is sort of ongoing giving people useful work to do and constantly expanding your movement by going out and bringing new people in and mobilizing is when lots of people who might already be part of the movement all show up at once for one particular reason and for us organizing is our ongoing work so we have structures that new volunteers can fit into and a cycle of kind of creating hype and then welcoming new people in and onboarding them into volunteer teams that works pretty well to keep our teams going and these teams really power the movement so they find the mps to challenge they clip and edit the videos of the challenges they message people on socials and invite them to the next welcome call they run the welcome calls and they call and text the people on the list to remind them to show up and take action um, so that's how we sort of see our organizing work and mobilizing has so far been how many people from our list can we be convinced to show up to this thing like like cop 26 or like coventry and going forward we're going to try and build the layers of volunteer leadership in our movement so that these things are more connected so we're using volunteer power to organize other volunteers in things like postering or outreach or door knocking to recruit for bigger mobilizations and spread the word about the green new deal and we haven't really tested that out yet, so we'll see how it goes. Um, that was a slightly random rundown of who Green New Deal Rising are and what we've got up to. Um, I'm now going to pass it over to Joe Todd, who's going to talk to us about big organising. Hey, thanks, Ellen. And thanks for everybody who's um, made time to come to the call. Just want to say I'm like super happy to be here. Like, you know, like it's basically XR and Green Deal Rising who are trying to do this stuff at scale out, outside of the electoral space. And it's just like, yeah, like the work you guys are doing is amazing. It's just like really, really good to, to be here and have the conversation. Um, a little bit on me. So I'm, I'm Joe. My uh, background was in student politics. I got into politics and the student movement, um, got arrested a couple of times uh, post 2010, and then got kind of like sucked into the Corbyn movement and the Labour Party like a lot of people did from uh, 2015 to 2020. Um, I ended up working as the head of communications at Momentum, the Jeremy Corbyn supporting campaign group. And because it was a, a wonderful but pretty like chaotic organisation, I also ended up doing a lot of the campaigning and um, helping kind of like structure our um, uh, general election campaigns for 2017 and 2019 so yeah like helping on the organizing side of that as well and specifically helping with the door knocking and how to get the door knocking big um now i work at an organization called the social practice which is uh the organization that becky bond um set up after she worked on the bernie campaign and we basically work to like help groups like xr green and rising but also trade unions and other campaigns Try and implement these. Can really you slow people. down and speak up, please? A couple of people have put it in the chat. Thank you. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, one second. I sometimes have a thing with Zoom where it puts my microphone volume way down. Is that better? Great. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I don't know why my computer does that, but it just decides to put me on mute. Probably because I have too many Zoom meetings and it gets bored of me. Um, yeah, so I used to work, I used to work for Momentum, now I work for an organization called The Social Practice, and The Social Practice, founded by Becky Bond, who was um, the person that um, Nula mentioned earlier, who coined this, uh, you know, like phrase, big organizing, in the first Bernie Sanders campaign, and yeah, we basically help social movements, organizations and campaigns, um, basically organize like really big volunteer programs. So like, how can you, you know, like knock on like 10,000 or a hundred thousand doors in the UK? How can you like call like half a million voters? How can, you know what I mean? How can you like, how can you like, get people doing stuff everywhere um, and get people really doing stuff at scale? And the reason we care about this really is because like, you know, we do firmly believe that like, there's a lot of people out there that want to take action. Just nobody's asking them to do it. Um, and we also believe that like, you know, the size of the problem is so big and especially when it comes to climate, but you know, also when it comes to capitalism, that we need like mass movement and mass action and lots of people out there doing stuff, whether it's door knocking, whether it's phoning voters, whether it's taking direct action, whether it's disrupting politicians meetings, 
all of these different forms of action are really important. Um, yeah, and I, I suppose what I'm going to use the next couple of minutes doing is I'm not going to run through some principles of big organizing. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about canvassing. Um, and I'm going to do that in part because I love canvassing and I'm actually like, <laughs> I'm a canvassing convert. So I used to be absolutely terrified of knocking on doors. Like it was just like, it was not my thing. You know, I was kind of like the spreadsheets guy. I liked being behind a computer. I liked being doing like that kind of activism. And yeah, like the idea of like going and knocking on people's doors who I didn't know and trying to like persuade them of something and trying to talk to people who, you know, like didn't already agree with me might be annoyed that I've like come out, you know, like and disrupted their, you know, like family evening or like they're just having dinner or whatever. The whole idea like terrified me. Um, but like through the Corbyn years and actually like more so after the Corbyn years and I'll explain why, um, I've really kind of like fallen in love with canvassing. I mean, at the moment I canvass uh, on Thursday evenings for a local community campaign in North London uh, that I'm part of. And yeah, we go, go out door knocking and go talking to residents about the campaign every Thursday, six till eight. If you live in Tottenham, you're very welcome to come. Um, yeah, and I kind of just wanted to like, yeah, like kind of like speak to the importance of canvassing both from a kind of like, I think like societal and emotional um, uh, standpoint, but also from a kind of academic perspective too. Um, because there's just been a lot of studies done to show that canvassing in certain situations works really well and in other situations works quite well. Um, yeah, and I think like when you're building a movement, one of the really important things is essentially to face outwards, right? Like it can be really, really tempting um, when you are facing, you know, like oppression from the police or you're facing a hostile media climate to search out the people who agree with you and build a little bubble with them and bunker down with them. And in part, that is really important when you're building movements because you need to build that sense of solidarity. You need to build that sense of community and you need to build the trust between people who are taking action, especially when you're taking action like you guys do, you know, like arrestable action, action that can have very large consequences. And that is really, really important. I think the downside of that is that it can often mean that we spend a lot of time talking to ourselves and talking to people who are very like us. And the beautiful thing about going out and talking to people and knocking on doors specifically, although it can be other conversations that you have in your community, you could be running a store or something similar, is that it forces you to face outwards. It forces you to have contact with reality almost and to speak to people who aren't already engaged, speak to people who don't agree with you and persuade them, to be honest, um, and come into contact with their points of view. Uh, and it was put really well earlier that like, we want to have a real sense of what people think in our communities and what people are actually saying out there. And at the moment, we only get that through social media or the Daily Mail or something similar. And just going out and talking to people on that level is really, really important. Um, I'd also say that it's quite, because it's quite a strange thing to do, I think it can be really enriching both for you because you get to meet your neighbours and you get to meet people in your community, which like I found like really, really valuable and actually talk to people who like aren't a lot like you. But also for people, yeah, like also for people who you talk to. Like I've, in fact, yeah, last week I spoke to somebody at length who, I think I woke them up. They were they were having a nap and they came down from their bedroom. And I thought, oh God, he's gonna be really annoyed with me because I've, you know, like he's obviously like been working nights or something. And we had, he was like very, very suspicious of me at first. He was like, who is this person knocking on my door wanting to talk about, you know, like this, this, this community campaign that they're involved in? Because nobody does that. But once he realized that like I was his neighbor and I live around the corner from him and I was there to talk to him about something that mattered to both of us because we live in the same place. It was just this really powerful thing. And we ended up talking for 40 minutes and he brought me a cup of tea out. And, you know, it was just really, really nice. And I think maybe it's different in other parts of the country, but definitely in London, that's not, it's not a thing that you experience that often unless you go out and do something like door knocking to actually find it. Um, 
Yeah, and I think the third thing that I'd argue from that, that kind of like emotional perspective is, is that we often think that the reason people stay in organizations is because of ideology or politics or agreeing with the vision of it. And I think that's in part the case, but a lot of the studies show that the bigger reason people stay in organizations is because they find a sense of belonging and because they find a community that they then want to be part of. It's really interesting looking at um, evangelical churches in the, oh no, not sorry, not evangelical churches, anti-abortion groups in the US where a significant percentage of people who end up being the most um, kind of like vital and um, loud activists for anti-abortion groups weren't actually anti-abortion before they were brought in. They were actually um, they were actually pro-life, pro-abortion or neutral on the issue, but they were brought in because they met people who gave them a sense of belonging and they built relationships with, and then this organization became their home. Um, yeah, so I think door knocking is really, really important on that basis too. Um, some of the academic stuff, and I'll just go through this so you guys can ask questions. Um, it's, there's different types of canvassing and different kinds of door knocking. Um, two main types, I think you'd call it either like turnout and persuasive canvassing. So turnout canvassing, and this is mostly based on elections because that's where most of the studies are done. The turnout canvassing, the... Um, the studies show that essentially it's really, really effective. So turnout canvassing is where you knock on doors and try and get people who you know are your voters. So say you're, you know, like a Labour Party door knocker or a Democratic Party door knocker. You're going and knocking on doors the way you know the voters there are Democrat or Labour because you've already ID'd them and you're trying to actually get them to turn out to vote. So you're trying to get them to do like this thing, make a plan and go vote on this day when it's polling day. And they've shown that this is like, it's just really, really effective. Like they estimate between six and 10% um, increases in turnout if you do like a successful door knocking operation. Various studies in the US show this, um, but also a couple from France when Holland was elected to. I think the more interesting stuff for you guys is maybe the kind of like deep and persuasive canvassing. Now there's a there's kind of an assumption, in, especially in the US because it's so polarized that it was impossible to persuade anybody who thought Trump was good that actually they should vote for Biden and vice versa because you know like it was seen that um, Democrats were Democrats Republicans Republicans and it was really hard to get people to move and switch from one to the other but there's actually been a lot of evidence um, both inside and outside of election time to show that people's minds can change and I think the one study that I would highlight was this one where the LA LGBT Center went and did a lot of deep canvassing around trans rights and they went knocking on doors basically to persuade people or to talk to people in a more open way about trans rights and trans people. And the really interesting thing was it didn't matter whether they were Democrat or Republican, a man or a woman, young or old, or what race they were, all were similarly persuadable um, and all were similarly movable. And I think this is a really, it's a really good example of an issue where um, yeah, you have the media being very, very polarized around it and it being this very kind of like intense issue that people are talking about. But actually when you have a face-to-face -face conversation, um, that can really move someone because you're connecting with them in a human way. And the key thing here was that they tested it with transgender people canvassing and they also tested it with non-transgender people canvassing and the results were the same. So there's actually no benefit to knocking on doors and like having that identity. And that just shows that like, it kind of doesn't matter who you are, like you don't have to have a certain identity. You don't have to be young or old or whatever. If you go out and talk to people in your community and talk with them in an open way and try and persuade them of a thing, that will help and that will make a difference. Um, I can talk about accounting for a lot longer, but I will, I'll stop there. And yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks, Joe. It's really, really informative. Um, thanks, Ellen and Nula as well. It's great to hear from, from all of you. We've got lots of questions coming in. Um, also, disclaimer, my internet is pretty crap. So um, just you'll have to shout at me and intervene if you need to. Um, first question I'm going to throw at you is going to be for Nula. Um, and it is from B. Uh, rem yeah, reminder to everyone who's watching, put your questions in the comments section or the chat and we'll try and get to as many as we can. From B, 
In trying to persuade people to engage in civil disobedience, how do you address understandable fears of being arrested, especially after recent changes in legislation? So I'll, I'll throw that at Nula, but obviously it's relevant to, to Green New Deal Rising as well. So if you want to jump in, Ellen, then go for it. Yeah, that would be great to hear from Ellen as well. Um, so yeah, this was definitely something that we came up against straight away in Project 3.5 that like, because of the kind of like two dimensional picture, like, or like one dimensional picture that people get in the media of XR, they, they kind of felt like either you've got to be up for being arrested, which feels like a big scary thing for a lot of people, or you can't be part of this group. And, and that's just never been the reality. So part of it is having that face-to-face -face contact with people and getting to explain like, oh, well, I was in the movement for this long before I even considered it. And I was very busy doing other very important jobs or um, just demonstrating that there's a whole world of things to do. The, the other thing that we're trying to communicate more broadly and in our talk that we invite people to on the doorstep um, is that the the more of you there are you know so if we all get behind this mobilizing effort it's like i said earlier we become impossible to repress as well so if you think about the iraq war march in 2003 the anti-iraq war march um different estimates but, but between one or two million people if all of them sat down on the streets the police are not going to start trying to make arrests it, it's completely preposterous so so there's there's safety in numbers, but it's really just getting to have the contact with people to explain those things and that whatever they do in terms of risking arrest will be like on their timeline and and their choice kind of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd say we have a really similar approach. Most of our actions are not things that people are going to get arrested for. MP challenges are legal. You know, we're just going to speak to an MP usually at a public event. Um, we've started to do some slightly more disruptive actions, but usually the, the biggest consequence is that we get removed from an event. Um, and so we, we we do try and sort of make sure that at all of our actions, there's roles for people who uh, who can't be arrested or who, who don't are not comfortable with that. Um, not much more to add, to be honest. Great, thanks both. Um, I'm just going to keep not trying not to do too much filler. I'm just going to keep doing the questions. So. Um, there's a really interesting one from Peter, um, which I'd be really interested to hear what people's perceptions are, of are. Um, what challenges and opportunities do you see to making intergenerational relationships at the heart of action? There's not a, it's not a question that's specifically about mobilisation, but super interesting because we've obviously got Green New Deal Rising here, a very youth-led, and I think it's fair to say Extinction Rebellion has got quite an older membership or, or base. Um, so yeah, Ellen, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that intergenerational relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think they're really, really valuable. I think the the sort of the people who are against us are always going to try and divide us on on any lines they can, right? And age is one of those. You know, the culture wars and the sort of divisions in society are often made based on age. The boomers are against the millennials, and the Gen Zs are against the boomers, and all of this. And actually, if we can show intergenerational solidarity and agreement on uh, bold action on the climate crisis and, uh, you know, an ending inequality, that's a really strong counter to some of those narratives. So I think it's a really, really valuable thing. It's sometimes a difficult thing to achieve. And, um, you know, the reason we organise with, uh, with under 35s primarily is because we found, you know, a sort of previous edition of, of Green New Deal, um, it was Green New Deal UK, and we're an all ages movement. And we found that actually we we weren't succeeding in recruiting all ages to our local hubs. And it was mostly older people, um, you know, the sort of generation who are really active in civil society and get involved in all sorts of wonderful movements. And that young people were maybe not wanting to get involved uh, in those same groups which is a shame and so we thought that in order to sort of carve out space and not be the same as other groups and other movements and do something that other people were already doing we should create a space for young people to organize and build a movement for them um, but there's absolutely 
space for intergenerational intergenerational sort of relationships and solidarity i think in the wider climate justice movement and i'd be really interested in exploring that maybe between between organizations and between parts of the movement yeah definitely i think we would definitely love to speak about that um i think it goes back to what joe was saying earlier about the having a sense of belonging being so important to to you joining something so it's a bit of a chicken and egg because you need you sort of need people of a certain demographic to then invite and, and for people to feel invited um so there's definitely scope for for really fruitful collaboration between our different movements i think um question for i'm going to go to joe first but it would be really great to hear anyone's thoughts on this um do you have any insights on moving people from being a passive supporter to an active one this is from hazel if and if it is our hazel then it's our, our hazel and we're we're like really struggling we're not struggling but this is a really big question for us how do we we can get people on a mailing list what what are some of the things you might advise for getting people from that passive state into an active one yeah 100 percent. i mean i just just on the question before as well just because i'm i'm just super interested in this like i think it my take on it as as well is is, is essentially that i think nowadays people's identity is less place-based so I think before you had an identity which was based around like a geographical place that you lived in and that place necessarily like contained older and younger people so you you lived in and identified with this like, intergenerational community now people's identity is a lot more either like generational or because of a subculture or because of a kind of like a, th a thing that they're into and often they're cut on like generational lines and I think that alongside the fact that just there's far fewer people who actually live in mixed neighborhoods now like the percentage of people who live on a street with both people over the age of i think 75 and under the age of 18 has like really dropped over the last 10 or 15 years um, i think those two things just make it really really hard um or really hard for it to happen organically anyway um with regards with regards to the with regards to the engaging people and making them not just an email on a list like yeah that's it's really tough <laughs> it's really tough it's also really it's really tough outside of a big moment the thing that we find to be really um mobilizing and energizing for people is a big national moment um and you can try and create these yourself that's you know xr's founding tactic right is to create a national moment via a rebellion and that really works like you know it was incredible but often they come from outside of you and some you can plan around like an election, others just happen and you have to try and organize around them. And that's not to say that it's the only way to do it. It's just that outside of like a big national moment that like really like grabs people's attention. It means lots of phone calls, as much face-to-face -face contact as possible, getting people doing stuff really quickly, getting people into like positions of responsibility, um, making sure there's like lots of different routes to engagement, which are both high and low bar, but also use different skills and suit different personality types. Tends to be good to have routes to engagement where people um, can do computer-based stuff that doesn't interact with other, with other human beings. And then for other people, you need non-computer-based stuff that's out in the community. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could go on and I'm happy to have some more one-to-one -one conversations if, it, if that's useful to, to, to try and help with that. But it is, I think that outside of those big national energizing moments, it is just a slog and organizing is a slog and there's some techniques and tactics can, which can make it easier, um, but it's never going to be easy. I, I suppose the one thing that I would emphasize is just like, and I think XR do this really well, so I'm, you know, I'm not trying to teach you to suck eggs, but um, yeah like actually calling people up and actually having face-to-face -face conversations with them is really important there are a lot of organizations in like the progressive or left space now which just rely on emailing people and they think that like if they email people enough they'll take radical action or they'll like take on really like high bar stuff and that's just been shown to not be the case like emailing people gets people to online events and it gets people to donate money and to sign petitions but it's it's not very good uh, at getting people to do much more than that Thanks, Joe. Yeah, really helpful advice and reflects helpfully a lot of what we've we're trying to work on in three point five. But as you say, it's it's just a lot of hard work. <laughs> um, Ellen or Nula, I don't know if either of you wanted to add anything to that. 
Um, I'm going to restate some things that Joe said. If you're working on this, Hazel, this is most of my job also. So do reach out and we can chat about it. Um, my two things would be ask them immediately. So as soon as they sign up to the list or as soon as they engage with you, get them to do something else. Because when they sign up, that's when they're most engaged and most excited about the movement and it's at the top of their mind. So don't wait. Uh, and the second thing is, like Joe said, one-on-one -on -one conversations. If you can call them, great. If you can talk to them face-to-face, -face, great. Uh, we have a welcome team who, when people join our Slack, they get a notification and they reach out to that person immediately and ask them how they want to get involved and which volunteer teams they want to join. Um, so those are the two things, one-on-one -on -one conversations and do it really fast. I would say what, just one of the tiny thing actually is also just don't, don't aim for like high intense engagement all of the time forever because that's that's a that's a goal that you're never going to hit and you i mean again it was a great example of this like all movements go in these peaks and these troughs and you have you know you have down periods as well as up periods and if you can look up there's a u.s organization called momentum who do a lot of um, movement training and kind of like movement study work which has formed the basis of organizations like the sunrise movement in the us and a few others and they talk about cycles of movements really well um yeah and it, it's basically just don't set yourself the goal of always having everybody doing everything because it's it's just not historically how movements have worked and it's it's just like too much to expect of yourself great thanks joe thanks ellen um next question i'm going to give you is from liam um anyone can answer this i think uh but maybe maybe it's good for ellen especially what are the steps that we take beyond door knocking here in the uk to build a sense of community and belonging for people especially for those demographics who aren't traditionally part of the climate movement um so ha yeah so we've talked a lot about door knocking in 3.5 um but we've only been going for about six months so we've started with that um, and now we're we're sort of trying to look wider at different different techniques and stuff. Um, but it'd be good to hear what people think about other ways of building a sense of community and belonging for people, especially in demographics who aren't traditionally part of the climate movement. Who would like to have a stab at that? I mean you put my name down for it. I feel very underqualified. Um, that's a huge <laughs> question. Um, I guess, you know, door knocking has, we, when we went to Coventry to do our first door knocking test, we went to working class neighbourhoods. We went to neighbourhoods with really high numbers of people of colour. Actually, a lot of people that we talked to on the doorsteps had English as a, a second or, or not their first language. Um, and that didn't negatively affect our, our sign up numbers. Um, but as I said, we, we do need to do more to sort of engage those people into being active supporters and not just sitting on the mailing list. Um, but in terms of creating community, that's something that um, I feel like we, we can't do as a central organisation. That's something that you'd have to build a sort of a local group or a local movement around um, that sense of community. Um, and it's something that we you know, we're just starting our sort of door knocking adventure and um, and haven't got to that point yet, I think. But we are working with um, with Zara Sultana's team in Coventry, actually, um, who have been reaching out to these people and, and bringing them into the local kind of Labour Party organising machine there. Um, but I guess I'd say that, you know, the, because people aren't traditionally part of the climate movement doesn't mean they're not also worried and that doesn't mean they're not also you know concerned about the things that we're concerned about we have a lot in common and just reaching out and making that first step and having that conversation is probably the most important thing to do um but yeah as i said i'm way underqualified for for the rest of that question i doubt that that was a great answer thank you nula did you want to come in on that yeah, I, I also don't feel like I have the full answer, but there's some things I could say, which um, I don't think he's here tonight, but there's like a superstar canvasser in our team called Ollie. Um, and during our last kind of big mass actions in London, people went like on mass door knocking and, and he's um, 
from Devon, um, but he went door knocking it with a group in Hackney on an estate. And there's something again, I mean, this is the perspective I come from just from having worked in the media team about what the media tells us people think about us. So everyone in XR has been so bashed for being too white and too middle class and all of these things. And it's so valuable getting to actually go and meet the people we're told think this about us. And I, you know, I'm just relaying his story, but his experience was that like, you know, if you're going to go and, and, you know, we, we often use a survey base for our, our canvassing. And, and one of the questions is like, how well do you think the government's doing on the climate crisis? If there's a group of people in this country who understand that our government does not like do anything they say that that they are completely failing it's it's like working class people and people of color in in like estates in london right and i think the the thing the take home thing from from what he reported back from that experience is that you know we have this feeling that like those people like what have i got to say to those people they they're not going to want to be door knocked by me i'm just old and white and male and blah 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 for in ollie's case and and actually someone knocked on their door and they gave a shit what they thought and they asked them questions and they were like, we want to do something and we've got a plan. And it was one of the most receptive audiences he'd ever come across. So we have to remember that what we've been told is what the media says. It's not what people think. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of hope there. And and we also kind of um, have a, a, you know, a plan that's never really got going in Project 3.5, but that those groups within XR, like XR Muslims and like XR Unify that, that holds a lot of different like groups in the UK, like BIPOC groups, um, will take this model and go, okay, well, how's this gonna work with my community? How's it gonna work if we take it to the mosque instead of like knocking on doors or we go to the Caribbean community center and like take what we've learned and adapt it to what they know about their communities. Um, so that's a potential other phase at some point as well. Great, thank you both. Um, just to follow up from, on from that, I, I think I've gathered the answer from your response, Ellen, but are you, in Green New Deal Rising, are you targeting a specific group of people when, when you're doing your outreach and speaking in communities, or are you, you know, like in, in a political party, they would target swing voters as sort of the equivalent? Yeah, I mean, it depends where we go. I think Coventry was a test, and in Coventry, we we're there because Zara Sultana is a Green New Deal champion. She's one of the most vocal supporters of a Green New Deal in Parliament, and she has a tiny, tiny majority. And so we knew that by intervening in that constituency, our little movement could possibly, you know, make a difference to that seat. And we wanted to speak to potentially non-voters, people who might be sympathetic, and we wanted also to grow our movement and grow it in a in a diverse way and go out into the communities of people who weren't traditionally represented in the climate movement. And um, what I didn't say before is it was important that we had some door knockers who could speak the languages that were common in the community we went to. So we had um, a conversation in Urdu, I think, and we had a couple of conversations in um, Farsi and others. And that's why it is really important to build a diverse movement from the start. It does make a difference. Um, but yeah, it's, we're not necessarily targeting a particular group of people everywhere we go. That was the first test of our door knocking program and we will roll it out. Possibly it targeted other places and possibly we will make a sort of distributed action that anyone can take anywhere. Um, it depends on how it's going to sort of fit into our strategy. Great, thanks. Really interesting to hear how you're, how you're going about and how you're changing it and innovating it as you as you learn more that's, that's what we're trying to do as well um there's a question um which i think is going to be really interesting have have we noticed i think anyone can answer this common trends in in how people respond to us so about the climate crisis is the things that we often hear on the door or in our community conversations um i can certainly say in my experience I think Nula said it earlier, like people are scared. Obviously there are people who are the exception to that rule and still don't have the awareness, but by and large, because we've been doing this survey, um, as Nula referenced, people score highly that they are scared about the climate crisis and they score very lowly on how well they think governments around the world are doing. 
that's like something we've heard all around the country. Um, wonder if that reflects what other people have have experienced. Ellen, do you have a go on? Sure. Um, I think the thing that we um, found quite common was the sense that like, oh yeah, climate change is a problem, but there's nothing we can do about it. Or politicians are all the same. There's no point in getting behind one or the other one. Um, and lots of this sort of kind of apathetic, um, everything's a bit futile um, sort of mindset, um, which was interesting and, and sort of not surprising given the like level of constant, you know, crap that we've dealt with over the last few years. Um, but it was interesting to see that like most people who had that mindset at the start of the conversation, like Nula said, you know, just having someone who gave a shit about what they thought and like had, you know, was interested in their opinions and wanted to have a conversation and could provide some, you know, some solution and some like, actually there is a plan. This is what we're doing about it. This is our plan of action. This is our theory of change. Um, was quite motivating to those people, even the most kind of nihilistic ones. Um, but yeah, I think that was a sort of the, the trickiest thing we saw that came up over and over again. Thank you. Um, right, we've probably got time for just one quick last one and I'm gonna chuck it at Nula because we get it quite a lot. So let's just answer it. It's um, how do we counter the criticism that the 3.5% claim was lifted from a book that was talking about other contexts? Um, well, the, the kind of main thing to say is we don't have alternative research. This is the best research we have. And we, you know, we've made, there's all sorts of things, right. That will, will play a part in the, in the ecology of change and in, in the, in the, the mass of things that bring about change. And, and we're not trying to be all of them. Um, we're trying to be one part, which is the mass participation part, the kind of welcoming people in the door, holding their hand into taking their first steps towards civil disobedience. You know, for instance, Just Stop Oil are slightly different. They're, they're higher, higher risk action, smaller numbers than us. Um, and so given we know we're trying to do the mass part, that's, I think, the best research we have. It's a, it's a bit gutting that, that um, Chenoweth and, and um, I can't remember the name of the woman that she worked with, didn't study stuff um that's more applicable to our context maybe they will do that because i think their research is being used a lot in in like liberal democracy kind of contexts i don't know gully if there's anything else you'd want to add but it's you know um or, or tim who's here from 3.5 team as well that's that's it i think all i would say is well what what i've got in the habit of saying is that we don't know if 3.5 is this magic number it doesn't really need to be that complicated. It's something to aim for. And when you boil it down, it's just people power. And we know that that is crucial to any sort of social movement to, for change. We need masses of people coming together and demanding it. And that's that's all it is really. Um, okay, I, I'm conscious of time. So I think that's probably all we're gonna do tonight. Um, for this one, maybe we'll do it again. Um, thank you so much for everybody who tuned in. And of course, to Nula, Ellen and Joe, thank you so, so much for sharing your time and your thoughts with us all. And also for all the work you're doing to bring us closer to climate action and climate justice and a better world. Um, thank you. Tomorrow evening, quick plug, tomorrow evening, Project 3.5 are having an open call where you can come and hear more detail about Project 3.5 and how to get involved. Um, and you can find the details of that on the 3.5 page of our website. So hopefully see some of you there again tomorrow night. Um, otherwise, take care. Thank you and see you on the streets. Thanks guys. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.